Trashomaniacs. Gearheads. Welcome to any new viewers or listeners. This is Geo Gearheads, a show about geolocation and technology. Of course, we're thrilled to have you and all of our regular audience members join us. I'm Daryl W4 with a bad cop and special guest as we're recording tonight about geocaching by UV light. You know, Daryl, this is just one example of a great show idea from our audience. And next week, we have the perfect show for all sorts of audience contributions. That's the Randomized Show, where Daryl W4 and I talk about a number of smaller topic topics, which won't make for a full show on their own. That might be new products, audience questions, tips, or, well, just about anything else we think might tickle your fancy. If you have something to share or would like us to discuss... Uh, or anything you would like to share or have us discuss, drop us a voicemail by calling 206-350-3647. You can also email us uh, the text of your comment or question at geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com. Or better yet, attach an audio recording. Yeah, the audio recordings are preferred over text as we really love hearing those in your own voice. That includes... Uh, in that you know, next week, not next week, but the week after next, uh, for show 60, uh, we're going to have the Northern Penguin return to talk about the Ontario Trails Project. And that's a couple more awesome shows for our uh, awesome audience to contribute. And speaking of our audio, awesome audience, our thanks go out to Jersey Eric for his donation to help keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Whether you're helping us through financial support, spreading the word by news or reviews telling your fellow cashers we really appreciate your efforts and that includes the coming geo gearheads 2013 traveler race where you'll get to activate and release your own traveler with your tip and you know that can be one you picked up from this very show and uh, we'll have a link to tb-run.com in our specific race in the show notes for this episode you know this race is just for fun but we've asked for prize donations, and once again, you've come through. Uh, GX Proxy has already shipped us a box of prizes for the race, and we look forward to sharing with that with you very soon. Yeah, the four Freds have already entered their Code Travel Beetle, which is TB4MYH1, in that race, and they shared the tip, always waymark your car. After having to backtrack on more than one occasion, I have learned this lesson well, especially in the new area. Thanks uh, for Freds, and congrats on being the first to enter. Now, we have John Robb, one of the two operators of Cash at Night, and he's responsible for sales and customer service, along with Ron Baker, who, well, apparently does all the hard work. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. You're very well, thanks welcome. for joining us, and we're glad to have you on uh, to help answer some questions about uh, UV lights and caching. But before we get into that, let's get a little bit of uh, background on you and your night caching. And as I understand it, a lot of that uh, really uh, uh, started to uh, uh, develop, shall we say, through the BFL boot camps. Yeah, yeah. Ron, uh, many years ago, back at uh, BFL number two, suggested that uh, perhaps like, we should try out this night caching thing. And uh, we did uh, some caches on uh, BFL Boot Camp 2, and it was just fantastic. These caches were some of the coolest, best that we've ever seen. And uh, we just finished BFL 7. I've been a contributor for the last two years, as has Ron. And uh, we have a ton of fun doing it. It goes from 9 o'clock at night till 4 in the morning. It's just crazy fun. We really enjoy it. Now, for those who don't know, and I happen to know, but, uh, you know, back <laughs> off, I'm not sure you know what BFL stands for. I'm guessing before first light. It, it, I've never heard that one. That oh, was okay. fantastic. I'm going to write that one down because <laughs> that was really good. That was really, really good. The uh, My mind was spinning trying to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the common uh, family-friendly version is big flashlight. Uh, okay. There is a sort of uh, 
another version that uh, the first word with the B is bunch, mm-hmm. and the last word L is lunatics, and I'll let mm-hmm. your listeners fill in the F part. <laughs> Furry. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, now I know that uh, up there in the uh, Toronto area, there's just a ton of those uh, great winter uh, events and, you know, late uh, uh, fall, early spring, because it is uh, dark longer and earlier and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, uh, you know, as I look out the window here tonight and it's dark, it's 9.30 at night, so of course it's expected to be dark, but in the middle of winter at 4.30, 5 o'clock, it starts to get dark, and we kind of like to go geocaching, and if you don't go geocaching at night, you get a really small window of which you can go caching, and we want a really big window, so we've decided that nighttime will not get in the way. Yeah, I don't like the uh, cold so much, but uh, it, you know, it is a perfect chance to get out there and do some night caching if uh, you have night accessible caches and they're not buried in snow. Uh, yeah, well, you know, summer, winter, it doesn't really matter to us. Warm, cold, rain, wind, uh, just wear the right gear and uh, you can go caching. You know, our friends out over in BC uh, or North U.S. Northwest, it rains a lot. And I'm pretty sure they cache in the rain because you don't have a choice. Uh, you know, maybe you'd be limited to five days a year where there's no rain, and you need more than that. Well, we got to keep our feet webbed, webbed during the rain. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And you know, one of the things I love when I'm out uh, caching at night, and uh, we start to hear those coyotes uh, howling. That's part of what makes night caching a whole different experience. Is there's different sounds, there's different feelings. Your vision is limited. You, the camaraderie with the people that you're with, and heaven forbid somebody is afraid of a noise. Uh, that becomes a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing that I really like about caching at night, though, is you've got uh, some really great caches that are specifically engineered to only work at night. And they really take that uh, caching to a whole nother level. And yeah. I just wish we had uh, more of those out here. The, you know, in our, my area, we don't have a whole lot of uh, areas that are open to night caching. You know, they actually close at you know, sundown, so you can't legally put a night cache in there. Uh, so that's been my big thing is I really want to do more night caching. You just have to find the right kind of places. Some places, uh, when you are sort of in the northern areas, uh, they don't close at dusk because, again, in the wintertime, that'd be 5 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So they close at some predetermined time, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And so that does leave you a fair amount of time where you can still do some night caches and uh, you just have to find the right location. But that is tricky, that's for sure. Yeah, and that's where our uh, few night caches are is in those parks that have a hard time of, you know, nine o'clock which is tough in the summer because sometimes in the summer you know sunset isn't until after that yeah exactly. uh, the uh, two big days of the year for us is the summer solstice and the winter solstice the summer solstice it's getting more dark we like it winter solstice that's the longest night we like that everything in between well we just take our chances <laughs> I like that now one of the reasons I like night caching is because it takes away a lot of that geo sense that you have during the day where you can stand in a spot and look around for 50 feet and say, oh, it must be over there. So when you're out at night, what are some of the things that you like to use to, uh, to help that geo sense? Uh, well, there's the whole BFL thing, you know, adequate light that, uh, and definitely headlamp. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, a good headlamp that, uh, that's probably one of your biggest assets is, is a good headlamp. And uh, finding the right kind of caches, too, that, that really helps. Um, especially, you know, the caches that are designed for nighttime. We know it's hard, so we do a lot of regular caches. But the, those that are designed for nighttime, they provide a little bit more uh, interest and uh, a little bit more fun. And it could be something really as simple as fire tacks, you know, very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, just about anybody can do those. Through to what we're talking about tonight, which is uh, UV geocaches, which that ups the game a little bit because there's a little bit more creativity involved there. Nice. Now, one of the things that confuses me about UV is there are so many different spectrums or wavelengths. Can you give me a little example of uh, what we're talking about? 
Sure. So, you know, everybody's seen the rainbow. The one end of the rainbow is all the purple colors all the way through to the red colors. So when you drop below purple, you get into ultraviolet. And that's usually, uh, you know, somewhere, not usually, but it, it's down less than 400 nanometers. That's into the ultraviolet. There's some that's close to visible light through to what we would, uh, you know, commonly talk about as being uh, black light, which is down uh, lower than uh, 400 nanometers. Then you've got the infrared, which is at the top end of the spectrum, which is over 900 nanometers. Everything in between, that's what we perceive as white light. Okay. So, what makes UV work better in the dark than, say, a infrared? Um, they, they both can take place at, at night, and there's different ways to deal with them. The reason UV works better... Um, well, both of them really, at night, is because during the day, we have this object in the sky that pumps out more UV and more IR than we can process along with white light. It just drowns everything out, and our eyes are designed to process that white light, unlike insects, say, that process uh, UV. And we just there's just too much white light. We can't see it. It's It's still there, but we don't see it. So you need that sun to go away so that we don't have any distracting lights and uh, allow us to see uh, the other spectrum. And we still also need lights to uh, for us to see that. Yeah, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of trouble when you have something that big and bright that just kind of flushes out everything <laughs> else out there. But when you're talking about the UV light, I know that there's a huge difference in the types of flashlights that you can grab. Yeah, I've I've seen uh, some cheap ones that are designed more for like the uh, bar use and stuff, where they're not really doing uh, the U light, uh, the UV, where they're not uh, uh, creating that nice bright glow that you'd expect. And sometimes they don't even uh, fluoresce at all with some of the uh, compounds. So what is the difference between those? So th this is really uh, everything below 400 nanometers. Now we're into the ultraviolet. But up near the top, that 380 to 400, that's still kind of visible to the human eye. Um, you need to get down into 365 nanometers for that true black light experience. And uh, there's not a lot of flashlights that uh, will allow you to kind of go down to those levels. And they tend to be a little bit on the more pricey side because it's hard to get the light down at that level. So most lights that you're going to buy are going to be 380 to 400. It's not the end of the world because most of what you're going to do geocaching wise, that's going to work. Um, the uh, I think that we have a, an image here of some minerals that are fluorescing under UV light and uh, those minerals are actually from Mars. So the uh, rover that's up in Mars has a uh, filter on it for UV, and we can see those bright spots in the image because certain minerals will fluoresce under UV light and others don't. And that's actually one of the ways, that, believe it or not, that they use to calibrate UV lights mm -hmm. is by which minerals fluoresce. That tells you what wavelength you're dealing with um, because all chemicals fluoresce at different uh, wavelengths and that's uh, sort of what you uh, see. Now, if you are caching in the U.S. Southwest, uh, sort of in desert country, then uh, you might want a UV light not just for geocaching but just to have um, because uh, critters will fluoresce also under UV light and it's pretty common to use it for scorpions. And if you're going to reach into a hole to find that cache, you might want to flash a little bit of UV in there to see if anything is glowing back. And if it is, then uh, maybe it's time to get the grabber to uh, to take that uh, <laughs> cash out of the hole. Yeah, this is going to be another show where uh, uh, those of you who are listening to the audio only might want to actually uh, swing over to the uh, YouTube link and actually uh, check out some of these uh, images that uh, we are showing. Yeah, I was sort of thinking about the whole idea, you know, this is mostly an audio show, but we're talking about light, and, you know, <laughs> how do you describe red light to a blind person? It's really hard, and uh, so, yeah, sometimes visuals, you just kind of got to have them. Sorry. No, don't be sorry at all. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the UV lights for cachers. And I do understand that there is supposed to be an attribute uh, on the cache page to indicate that you need a uh, UV light. Yeah, there, there is a, an attribute for that. And uh, uh, I have placed caches that were UV caches that did not use the UV attribute because I wanted to increase the level of difficulty. We have a lot of UV caches here. This is kind of home of the BFL. So people have kind of become accustomed to the UV uh, caches. Uh, if you're in an area where this is a brand new thing, you want to introduce it with the UV attribute. And uh, it's pretty simple, just the letters UV with a little purple bar underneath uh, to let you know that this is a UV uh, enabled cache. Uh, very handy to put on uh, if you don't want to make it too hard. So what kind of light do we want for a UV cache? Well, it really depends on uh, sort of how much uh, caching you're going to do. I think we have a visual for uh, some different kinds of uh, some uh, lights. Uh, I carry a, a bunch of UV lights. I don't know if that's because of what I do or because I just like to have lights. I'm not, I'm not sure which, but uh, one that's uh, very popular is a, a three-in-one and uh, mm -hmm. these come in smaller sizes and bigger sizes or you can get a dedicated uh, UV uh, light either way and uh, that's uh, it depends on how much you uh, want to carry around with you uh, the 3-in-1 is very popular because it has a white light it has a UV light and it has something that at night is very helpful which is a laser and you can tell your friend no look at the laser that's where the cache is and uh, so that becomes uh, very helpful. So we have uh, all kinds of different sizes, little button lights, little small three-in-ones. Uh, we also have a fluorescent. And when we were talking about the, uh, the wavelength, the uh, fluorescent light has a short wavelength. And it also has AA batteries, which I try and limit all of my flashlights to AA batteries if I can so that I only have to carry one kind of battery with me into the field. Uh, not always possible, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we carry the uh, fluorescent, because it uses AA batteries. We can get other flashlights that uh, use AA batteries, but you go from sort of $15, now you're talking a $35, $40 flashlight, and if you've only got one or two caches in your area, you might not be looking to invest that kind of money in a flashlight. So the prices exactly. range, you know, a little button light is about $1.50 through to a 3-in-1 or a, a full UV flashlight of about $15. So it kind of depends on uh, how much you're going to use it, what you're going to use it for. Choice. <laughs> and obviously uh, distance, the, uh, the effective distance of the light itself. Yeah, I have a. I placed a, a cache. We're going to talk about it a little bit later, which is a monofilament, and uh, it's two, three yards off of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And I have a um, 21 LED UV flashlight. We call it the high output, and it throws the UV beam a greater distance, maybe 10, 15 feet. Well, I can see the UV cache from the sidewalk, but if you've only got a tiny little button light, mm -hmm. you kind of have to get right up next to it in order to uh, get the same effect. So yeah, the, the distance uh, really does make a difference. I even have a, uh, an, uh, a royal blue laser. I uh, probably don't see it on the, uh, the camera. But uh, it will actually fluoresce UV uh, items. So I can shoot that one because it's a laser a lot further. I haven't found a cache purpose for that yet. But when you see that purple laser, man, it's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, I got to get a purple laser. I'm happy with a green, but purple is even better. Well, I've got green, red, purple. Um, I'll take them all. Yeah, the more yeah. lasers, the merrier. <laughs> and I tell you, you get a bunch of guys around a campfire and you pull out some lasers, watch out. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like it could actually get a little bit dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just uh, the thing we always say is do not cross the beams. There you go. <laughs> now, the reason put that your we eye out. <laughs> now, the reason that we actually brought you on was a question about the uh, different UV markings. So why don't we get a little bit into uh, the options there? Sure. The, uh, the two most common, uh, well, 
the single most common option for UV is a UV pen. And uh, it's just a... Uh, it looks just like a pen, and you write on it. Uh, they kind of are sold sometimes as invisible ink. Um, there's a little flashlight at one end, so you can see what it is that you've been writing. It's just a pen. And uh, these are really common. Uh, whenever we do an event, uh, people really like them. Uh, they like them because the kids just love them. They The kids love these. I'm not so sure about the parents. They get home, and I don't know what they see on the walls when they turn on that UV light. I, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. But the uh, the one thing that you have to remember about anything that is UV reactive is exposure to UV light will degrade the performance over time. Hmm. So uh, you always want to keep anything that you're doing with UV sort of in a dark, out of the sun kind of uh, area. And if you're dealing with a pen, you want to put that on some kind of a smooth surface um, that uh, will absorb a little bit of the material. So things like hard plastic aren't great because it'll come off. And UV, uh, this will not, the, the pen will not tolerate um, water. So you, what we typically recommend is that you uh, laminate it and uh, inside of uh, a little laminated sheet and you put the uh, a piece of paper in there and that's what you go with. That gives you a little bit longer um, protection and even that I had one cache that uh, was placed that way and it was in the field for about a year and I had to replace the UV pouch because even though it's in a lock and lock even though it's protected from the sun even though it's protected from moisture it's the environment and it mm -hmm. will uh, get in there and, and cause some some damage um, people do ask you know is it uh, hazardous or uh, this isn't um, sort of the uranium kind of stuff that you see in watches it's just UV. It's uh, pretty harmless, um, and the quantities are pretty small. I mean, I don't recommend eating it, chewing it, drinking it, or anything like that. But uh, if you, you know, put it on your arm and you happen to lick your arm, why you do that, I'm not sure. But it, uh, I think these are the same kids that write on the walls. It, the same kids that write on the walls. <laughs> and one of the things that we saw this year at BFL uh, boot camp, which totally blew me away was uh, UV uh, printer cartridges for uh, your printer, computer printer. And uh, it was uh, Avenar, one of the uh, organizers of the event, uh, he printed pictures in UV. And these were full-color pictures that only show up under UV light. So when you look at it under white light, it's a white sheet of paper. You put the UV on there, and boom, there is a full-on, full-color picture under UV light. It was just spectacular. It was very cool. That being said, that was a $500 investment in order to make the uh, the uh, 10 uh, clue cards that were used. That's not going to happen with a lot of caches. Like, it, it's, uh, yeah, that's a serious investment for a geocache. Yeah. yeah, well, that's one of the things that happens at BFL. Uh, that uh, <laughs> These are not uh, inexpensive caches. Wow, no, it doesn't sound like that. Incredible. Well, I think mine might have been one of the cheapest. It was uh, all in. I think we were looking at about maybe 40 or $50, and I think that was one of the cheapest. Okay. I had no idea you could use color ink, uh, UV reactive ink. I assumed it was just UV reactive ink, and it was, you know. Sort of one color all the yeah, time? Yeah, the one color that it is. Yeah, it, that is pretty much what happens, but because different minerals fluoresce at different wavelengths, mm. then you have four colors, they fluoresce at different wavelengths, you put those four colors together, and now you have your full color image. Um, it still always kind of has sort of a little bit of a purple cast because of the <laughs> UV, but uh, it, uh, it, was, it was absolutely spectacular. There was, it was very cool. Nice. Nice. And the... Uh, the thing that uh, we're very excited about actually is uh, UV paint. Um, we like the UV paint because it is not as uh, susceptible to water as the inks, which means you can put it on things uh, without uh, laminating them or doing any of that kind of stuff. So it becomes a very, um, I don't know what the right word might be, but the versatile maybe is a, mm -hmm. is a good way to, to do it. Um, and uh, Again, the we have the blue. It does come in different colors, uh, but uh, it uh, 
we're seeing a pretty good adop adoption with the uh, UV paint because it's different. Um, but as with everything else, make sure you have permission before you use any of this stuff anywhere. You know, always get permission for your geocaches and uh, definitely when you're using something like this. You mean I can't paint the side of my big box store with UV light? They're not going to see it during the day. Well, if you ask them, then feel free. <laughs> and uh, there, there is actually uh, an entire movement to do sort of uh, quote-unquote graffiti using UV spray paint. Uh, because it does come in a spray paint. And again, mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing. It's not visible during the day, but at night, boom, there's your UV, you know, under UV. But mm -hmm. uh, again, not a caching application, but uh, it is possible. <laughs> nice. <coughs> so beyond paint, what else do we have? Well, uh, something that, um, that we have found to be really uh, interesting is a UV monofilament. And uh, with the UV monofilament, uh, what we suggest is that you have two kinds. There is one that does not fluoresce, and there's one that does fluoresce. So the image that's on the screen right now, you can see one is fluorescing and one is not. And this allows you to create shapes, numbers. Uh, what we do is we, the image that you're seeing right now, it's under white light, so nothing is fluorescing, and you can kind of make mm -hmm. out some arrows, and you can kind of make out some eights. Well, right. that's what it looks like under white light. You can't really discern anything from that, and the two monofilaments look pretty much the same under white light. It's not until you turn on the UV, and suddenly you see... Maybe it's a shape like an arrow, maybe it's a number, a couple of numbers, could be letters. And the grid pattern on the, um, the plate that we have there allows you to make all those different shapes and you don't have to pre-drill them, and, which is just okay. a headache. And this stuff is waterproof. Um, we just uh, placed one the other uh, day and uh, it's not even in a container. It's uh, just uh, hanging from a tree underneath some branches. It's waterproof. Um, it, this is the, the image that you see on the screen now is the same monofilament inside a container, um, and it's under white light. This one is actually in the field. This was a cache that we did, uh, we visited, uh, and uh, that's what it looks like under white light. You can't tell. You, you have no idea what the numbers are until you hit it with UV, and now all of a sudden you can see the coordinates start to come out. And uh, as long as you keep it out of the direct sunlight, it will mm -hmm. last a long time. You need something to tie it to or wind it on to or, mm -hmm. or do something with, but uh, you can, uh, it will last for quite a while and you can put it out in the environment. Nice, nice. Uh, before we go too much further, this is uh, something that nobody else has seen before. This picture, I took this picture a little while ago. I haven't shown it to anybody. In the, this is a different way of using the monofilament. Mm -hmm. Instead of making numbers, mm -hmm. what I did was I took a pen, a little okay. sort of uh, paper mate pen or whatever, mm -hmm. and I cut it into a certain size and I drilled holes in it. And in those holes, I fed through the monofilament. So you have a little stick that has a bunch of monofilament wrapped around it. Again, under white light, you can't discern the difference. Mm -hmm. But when you turn on the UV, suddenly now you can see that some of them fluoresce and some of them don't. And you can make coordinate sticks where there's a certain number on one, another on another, you know, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these you can place, again, it's weather friendly, keep it out of the the sunlight and you'll be okay. It's a plastic pen, so it's not going to uh, wear away under the rain or anything like that. Right. And it's also just slightly different that you kind of have to think about it. And mm -hmm. you know, if you've ever found one of those caches where somebody takes a bison tube and then they hang it down inside a sewer or something like that, mm -hmm. you can do that kind of thing with one of those because it's going to be out of the direct sun. Right. So if you're trying to do it at night, you're saying, Daryl, oh, I want to do a night cache, but there's no parks I can do it in. Well, there's probably a sewer somewhere along the way that, uh, you know, a rain gutter or something like that or some other place that everybody's entitled to use that during the night and uh, maybe there's a place to put that. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, underpasses and uh, stuff like that too. Yeah, yeah exactly, mm -hmm. those kind of places. Mm -hmm. Although uh, 
again, we might want to watch sort of what we put where because some people. Yeah, uh, very react. true. But yeah, you've got some uh, great like rail trails and things uh, throughout mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. world that, you know, I, I just think that this would be a great uh, option there. Well, I, I will. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, Ron doesn't mind uh, if I share this, but uh, for the latest BFL, Ron actually uh, did one of the little mini grids with coordinates, and they were underneath a bridge. And mm -hmm. you walk over the bridge to get to the first clue, and then that clue brings you back to the bridge, but you don't see anything on the bridge because the clue is underneath. It's black, substrate with clear monofilament, you can't see a thing. It's night. It, you don't see it unless you pull out the UV. And uh, it, you know, one of the things that's happened sort of around our area is that people throw UV on everything. They find any card anywhere. Hey, let me put the UV on that because you just don't know if it's going to be a UV cache or not. So mm -hmm. they uh, they don't want to take You've trained them well. <laughs> Certainly, the people that have uh, attended the BFL boot camp they. Uh, uh, they've uh, definitely learned a couple of uh, things along the way for sure. Nice. Now, you were talking a little bit earlier about uh, minerals that uh, can fluoresce. I, I would think that that might have uh, some applications in things like uh, earth caching too. And we actually have a earth cache near here that uses this very principle. Um, you take your UV light and you shine it uh, on the a certain part of the rock, and you see uh, something fluoresce. Uh, so that's definitely something that you can do um, as an earth cache. If you find the right kind of minerals, you have to do a little bit of research, but that's kind of the point of an earth cache is to uh, do a little bit of uh, research. Now, going back to the uh, paints a little bit, I think you had uh, mentioned that those are actually non-toxic, but the pens uh, were toxic. Am I correct? Uh, nothing. None of them are toxic, but we don't recommend that you ingest any of them. Okay, because that had been one of the questions that uh, prompted this mm -hmm. discussion: is uh, toxicity of the uh, various uh, uh, marking uh, items. So I would assume that the uh, monofilament you wouldn't have to worry about at all because it's basically just a plastic uh, um, strand, and if that comes loose, then of course it would have issues. But yeah, and, and most of the monofilament is in really small sections. Um, it comes sort of as a 10-foot uh, length, but you end up cutting it into small pieces to do the mm -hmm. threading into the uh, the coordinates and whatnot. So even those are usually, you know, they're only at most a few inches long. Um, you know, people have been putting uh, UV uh, inks on their hands at uh, bars and other events for a long time, and uh, it's, it's not, uh, there's been no issue thus far. Right. Well, and that actually brings up an interesting point too, which I don't think we'd want to actually use for caches, but might be interesting for like a letterbox hybrid. Is what about the uh, UV stamp pads? It, yeah, yeah, that would be uh, very interesting uh, to to do. Yeah, my concern would be they're probably water soluble, intended so that you know when you go to the bar and get your hands stamped, it will actually wash off instead of stay on for you know four or five weeks. Uh, that is the challenge. I mean, if you've ever been out, you know that those things don't come off all that easily, but uh, yeah, it, it will eventually come off, which is why you know, it's not suitable out in the environment uh, in a cache location by itself. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you're saying the, uh, the paint is far more permanent. Yeah, the, the paint lasts uh, a, mm -hmm. a good long time. The, uh, the, yep. Okay. And so why don't we talk a little bit about how you'd actually use this in your uh, cache to make the clues. Sure. One of the, the things that we've discovered over the last few years of uh, doing BFL boot camp and whatnot is you need to, uh, just like a good ma magician, you need to divert the eyes. You need to uh, give people something that makes them think that they've actually found what they need. So the image that you have on the screen right now shows a card that has coordinates printed on it in white light and UV light. And under white light, there's black coordinates, and the, the black on white is exactly what somebody expects to see. The coordinates take them to a location, they see those, and off they go. Uh, but 
when you hit that card with UV, you actually see that there's a second set of coordinates. So pretty much with all UV caches, you kind of want to give either a decoy or don't make it so that if I hold the card at a certain angle, I can kind of see where the paint is and mm. you know make it shiny and it, depending on how hard you want to make it. Actually, I mean, if you don't care if it's that hard, then do whatever you, makes you happy. But uh, I come at this sort of having or, been part of the organization team for the BFL boot camp, and we strive to bring innovation and interest and not necessarily make it so easy. Um, so we're always thinking, uh, what little trick can we do? Uh, devious. I like uh, that devious, in the uh, Yes, a very, <laughs> good, very good word. That, that, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, and obviously if you have something like those uh, cards, that would be, uh, be something that you'd want to keep in a uh, container of some type so that you weren't exposed to the elements. Yeah, don't want to expose the elements, and you don't want to be exposed to sunshine. The way things work um, for UV is they react with the light as it hits it, mm -hmm. and so any UV that hits that object, it's going to react, and that reaction breaks down over time, and so the more UV you expose it to, the more it breaks down, and eventually you don't really get the reaction anymore, and now you have to either go and reapply or make a new card or do something else, uh, which is the same with the monofilament. You don't want to expose it to direct sunlight. Yeah, and exactly, as we've been saying throughout the show, the sun is this the largest source of UV light we have available to us. Yeah, somebody actually asked me one time, you know, oh, I get this UV flashlight, is it safe for my eyes? And I don't recommend you point any source of light directly at your eyes, mm -hmm. but the sun puts out more UV more consistently over a longer period of time than any one flashlight that uh, you're going to have unless you sat there for a while pointing it straight at your eyes, which we don't recommend uh, at all. And kids don't sit and stare at the sun either. And yeah, Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that'll hurt. <laughs> Now, okay, we've talked about putting in the uh, coordinates, but and you mentioned though you had those uh, uh, sticks with the uh, wraps on it. So you know, we we obviously don't have to do just coordinates as our clues. No. So, you, what are some of the other things that you've actually uh, tried? Well, we we do have the sticks of the we showed the picture of. They're shapes, so you can do a different kind of a shape. Um, whether it's you know simple as the the picture showed as of an arrow. Or, you know, you can make sort of uh, geometric kind of shapes, you know, squares, uh, octagons, r r rectangles, whatever shape it was that you wanted um, in order to do it. And you can even do something, again, also devious, is if you take a stick, like just a plain old stick, and you drill holes in it, and you wrap some UV monofilament around that, mm -hmm. and you put that back in the woods, and that's your coordinates, ooh, baby, now you're talking <laughs> a tough cache. And because uh, there's nothing sort of to really give you that indication, and especially if you list it as a night only cache, mm -hmm. and now there's nothing to really indicate that hey, that's what I'm looking for. That one could be really tough. Um, it, it, again, it depends on how devious you want to be or how tough you want to make it. Uh, you can go from easy to hard. Nice. And one of the things that I would worry about too would be. Uh, at, you know how you actually do it. I think I'd want to probably do something on like a sticker or you know plastic or something like that if I was going to just stick it out somewhere, because things like that paint that you mentioned are going to be there, uh, you know, pretty much permanently until they get painted over or something. And I don't think that I'd want to uh, do that, especially without permission. Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the big key, right? In geocaching, we don't want to do anything that uh, you can't easily remove. So paints, glues, any of those kinds of things are always uh, um, something that you need express permission to do. Um, I did a geocaching event uh, for a corporation, and they allowed me to put UV on one of their corporate signs so that when people came there, they had to find the UV. So, you know, they thought that that was pretty neat, but that was an explicit permission kind of mm -hmm. deal. Um, again, as with anything geocaching, get the permission. In most cases, I'm pretty sure if you went and explained to somebody, 
I've got this UV paint that's invisible unless you shine UV light on it. Uh, I want to put it on the back of your bench. Uh, I don't know too many people that would object. Some will, I'm sure, but uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, maybe is not that big a deal. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can see one of the obvious objections would be what happens when they want to uh, restain the wood on that bench or repaint the tunnel. Is whatever paint that they'd use uh, going to uh, cover that well? A uh, very, very good concern, very valid concern. Um, again, as with anything in geocaching, get the permission first. Uh, explain what it is that you're trying to do, and uh, you know you might find a, a compromise along the way with the people that uh, you're working with, where they go, okay, you can't put it here, but maybe over here will work for you. Um, mm -hmm. My experience has been that uh, when you explain what it is that you're trying to do, uh, most people are kind of understanding, and unless you get some kind of hard-nosed person, uh, in most cases, they're pretty reasonable. Sure, and as we kind of have gone over already, you know, you can put it on anything from like paper to metal to wood and you know, plastics, so stickers, that kind of stuff would uh, mm -hmm. work well. Exactly. So you could come up with uh, something that might not be as uh, uh, as uh, invisible as putting it directly on the object. But there's always going to be a workaround, and I, you know, I could see taking some kind of uh, metal plate that's just you know a number stamp, uh, you know, as if it's like a, a identifier on a tree or you know something to that nature and using the UV on that uh, metal plate so that it's not something that looks out of place on the object, but that's not actually on the object directly. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what we talk about when we talk about decoys, is if you take one of those kind of looks like a marker kind of idea, even if it was, uh, you know, those flat magnets you can get sort of sheets of, mm -hmm and you you know make a number and you put that number on a magnet on something that's metal but in fact you've got UV on there for a different color or for a different number um, that's that's a different way to do it in such a way that you can easily remove the magnet um, so that might be a workaround for somebody uh, the one thing about paper is um, if you've ever looked at different sheets of paper some of them are really bright and some of them are not so bright those really bright ones, that really bright white paper, doesn't make a good surface for UV because it's going to fluoresce. That's part of what makes it so bright is it's reacting to the UV. So you want to get um, paper that doesn't actually fluoresce. So take your UV flashlight into the store and check the paper before you, uh, you buy it. Um, we do offer in the store some paper that's... Uh, very good for this purpose, but uh, you can get different paper for uh, UV. What about like the uh, <clears throat> right in the rain paper or the uh, what's the, what's the National Geographic one, Daryl? Adventure paper. A adventure paper. Well, I've never seen adventure <sighs> paper, and uh, we've never. I don't know that we've tried it on right in the rain paper because we didn't really see an application for it because we didn't want it actually to be wet. <laughs> so um, we we didn't see an application there. I, I will try okay. it. I will try it. My mind keeps going to taking a an old fence board, you know, and, and spray painting the uh, the numbers on it, you know, having numbers taped on and then pulling those off so they would be the dark spot on the uh, fluorescent board and just laying it face down at uh, ground zero. That's a very good idea. <laughs> Uh-oh, I gave it away. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked about the uh, far end of the spectrum with UV now. Before we uh, uh, let you go, can you give us a little bit of uh, info on the IR? Because you mentioned that that was at the opposite end of the spectrum. Right. So we've got the UV down at the 400 nanometer and below. And UV is a reactive kind of light. When something uh, hits it, it, uh, it fluoresces and it sends some photons back at you. Infrared for geocaching works slightly differently. It's not what you shine it on, it's what you shine it through. So what you're looking at here is an infrared uh, light, and this is a picture now of the, the light source. Um, take your pick, either one. It, <laughs> the, uh, the light source, as it's captured for visible uh, light through a camera, what you have to remember is infrared is invisible to the human eye you need something that's going to capture that light. So if you've ever seen a green kind of picture 
from a camera. That's usually some kind of a night vision kind of a situation. That's the light is uh, being that's the infrared light that's being picked up or being reflected back because there's an infrared light source. So when you're doing a UV cache, there's two things that you need. You need an so I said UV earlier, but I meant infrared. You need an infrared light source, and you need something that captures infrared. So I did a cache that was an infrared cache, and all of those people with uh, iPhones couldn't do the cache because the iPhone has a very uh, effective infrared filter on the camera lens. So it wouldn't pass the infrared light through. Remember, you need two things, an infrared source and an infrared uh, capture device. So I had to put on the cache listing page that this is what you needed, and it led to a number of different issues. So the picture you see on the screen is the container, and inside that container, I had an infrared LED. And the cacher would bring a AA battery with them, put that into the cache, that would illuminate the IR LED, and then they would use, in my case, it was a BlackBerry or some other kind of camera that would capture the infrared. A really easy way to test if your camera sees infrared is to go and get your TV remote, turn it around and shine it at the camera and push a few of the buttons. If you see that the LED lights up in your camera, then mm -hmm. your camera will see infrared. If it doesn't light up in your camera, then you need to find either more powerful LED or a different camera. So with, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I with my uh, iPhone 3GS, I used to check remotes all the time to see if their batteries were dead because that one did not have an IR filter. Yeah, I never even thought about that. Man, I'm learning stuff hanging around with you guys. <laughs> this is good news for me. So would you consider these caches, either uh, UV or IR, to be a difficulty five cache because you need special equipment? Oh, we, we have talked about that a number of times. Because of the presence of the UV attribute, I don't know that I would put it into a difficulty five mm -hmm. um, because there's a, an easy way to sort of say this is a UV cache. Or, and if you bring the UV light, it's really not that, that difficult. It's just sort of the light that you need. Okay. Um, infrared is a little bit more tricky because um, you need to do a, a few different things to kind of sort all of that out. Um, but uh, I don't know that I've listed any of mine as being um, difficulty five. Okay. Good all to right. Know. Well, thank you very much for sharing all of this uh, great information. And you have a lot more information that you share on your uh, website as well. And you do have a blog along with the uh, storefront. Can you kind of give uh, folks uh, some, uh, you know, tips on uh, getting more information from that site? Sure. I, I actually uh, prepared a blog post about ultraviolet and infrared uh, caches so people can read up a little bit about it with some examples. Uh, if they just go to our uh, blog, uh, cacheatnight.com slash geocaching, and then uh, look for the ultraviolet, there is a link uh, that will be in the show notes um, so people can find that. And uh, there's also a bunch of products uh, on the site itself. All Everything that we talked about uh, here tonight, the lights, the paints, the pens, the papers, the pouches, the monofilament, uh, that's all uh, listed on the website as well. Yeah, an easy uh, one-stop shop for anyone who's uh, interested. Uh, but we have had a, a couple of comments in the uh, uh, chat for this uh, show wanting to know where they can find uh, these type of caches. So could you give them uh, maybe your caching name or and uh, some of your uh, friends' caching names to check out these uh, really uh, ingenious caches? Sure. Um, if you look me up, I'm Team Voyager. Uh, no E at the end. So it's uh, Team Voyage. G, then an R, no E. Uh, just look me up, Team Voyager, or uh, go to uh, our website, cashatnight.com, and in the About Us, there's uh, some description of uh, Ron and I. Ron's Baker's Dozen, I'm a Team Voyager, and on my profile, I link to a bunch of the BFL uh, caches, and if you just do a search on Google for BFL Bootcamp, you'll find the website for BFL Bootcamp, and that will take you to uh, a bunch of resources around uh, night caches. And uh, about a year or so ago in Ontario, there was, uh, I think it was seven UV caches, 
and I think we're now approaching 40 uh, UV caches. So these are specific uh, caches for UV, um, so it's gaining in popularity uh, locally here anyway. Nice, nice. Now, you also uh, have a little bit of an incentive to get some of our listeners uh, off their butts and uh, ordering uh, uh, their supplies to try out their own UV caches. So why don't you uh, let them know what that is? Sure. Um, we uh, we actually started the whole company because we wanted to make a geocoin. Cash at Night uh, was our geocoin. So uh, anybody that uh, orders $25 or more worth of product can get a free Cash at Night geocoin. All they have to do is add it into their shopping cart when they've got their 25 items, $25 worth of items, and uh, they will get that at no charge. That's a $12 value. Uh, so if they just go to our website, cashatnight.com, look around for some products, and once they've got some things, find the geocoin in the geocoin section and add that in, and they will get themselves a free geocoin. Oh, Excellent. That's very nice. Yeah, I'm just excited to give people a little bit more push to uh, hide some UV caches because I really want to find some in my area. <laughs> well, you know, Daryl, you have been invited twice to come up to BFL Boot Camp, and we've yet to see you. Is it because it's cold in October? <laughs> no, no, it's because of scheduling conflicts. Why? See, it's still a day's drive, uh, you know, there and back kind of thing, and I don't, you know, I really want to make it, but. Uh, uh, scheduling can be such the uh, problem. You know, real life gets in the way of our caching constantly. <laughs> well, it goes from nine o'clock at night until four in the morning. Drive up on the during the day, cache all night, and then drive home the next day. See, I need the autonomous cars so that I don't have to actually <laughs> drive and I can sleep during that point. Uh, that's why you need a driver. Yes, you need a driver. exactly. Nine p.m. to four a.m. Very few people are actually working during those hours. It's a it's the driving to and from and getting <laughs> sleep so that you don't crash. That's the problem. Well, you'll be happy to know that the BFL boot camp has been going for seven years. Some of the first BFL boot camp caches are still active, so you can come and make an entire week of it, Daryl. Oh, <laughs> I, I'm sure I could, but I think I'm I'm going to need some help for a lot of those because uh, I I've seen some of the. Uh, uh, stuff coming out of those boot camps that I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, this year, um, I know we're just about wrapped up here, but this year we had uh, two streams. We had the Virtue Series and the Sin Series. And the Virtue Series were kind of a little bit more newbie friendly, mm -hmm. and the Sin Series, not so much. Okay, see, I'll, I'll go for the newbie friendly ones, at least initially, because you know, I, I, I just don't have enough experience finding uh, night caches yet. You're welcome to join us anytime. Very good. And don't forget that uh, those of you watching or listening to this, you can uh, join us live again next week as we do our randomized 10 show. And the following week, we're going to be talking about uh, the Ontario Trails Project. So, you know, drop us a note uh, if you have something you'd like to have talked about on the randomized show or uh, even on that Ontario's Trail project, which if you're going to head out to one of those BFL boot camps, I think you'll want to check that out. Exactly. Don't forget to check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, or through social media. Your support help keep, helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2013 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved.